Hello, how are you? I'm the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com, and I hope you're having a great day. We're going to, once again, work on some exercises from the excellent textbook, Socratic Logic by Peter Kreeft. Now, originally, I wasn't going to do a set of exercises from this particular chapter, because we've already done some exercises from this chapter, but I changed my mind because I want to talk more about the so-called categories, and working through some exercises helps, definitely. So chapter two is on terms, and we have section two on categories on page 54. So let's just flip our way to that. Okay, so on page 55, you have the list of the so-called categories. And traditionally, there are 10 categories. But what are the categories? Well, the categories are ways we can talk about predication in general. So if we think about propositions like all men are mortal or Socrates is a man, we have a subject and we have a predicate. And we can classify the different types of predicates that are out there. So we have 10 traditional categories. We have substance, which is just an individual thing or entity. We have quantity, quality, relation, place, time, posture, possession, action, and passion. Now, Creep uses slightly different terminology than other textbooks, but that's perfectly okay. But let's think about this, and then we'll go through some of the exercises down here. So... First off, we have essence, and the essence of something is just the nature of a thing. So once again, think about a proposition. How about Socrates is a man? So Socrates is the subject, and being a man is the predicate. The predicate describes something about the subject. In this case, the predicate is of an essential kind. We're talking about the nature of Socrates. But we can also have, in certain cases, just references to an individual thing, a substance. Okay. But then we have such categories as Quantity, how much, quality, what kind, relation, compared to, place, where is it, time, when, position, or what Peter Kreef calls posture, how is it situated, habit, or what Peter Kreef calls possession, which is to be equipped in one way or another, and then action, which is an activity or doing, and passion, which is an undergoing. Now, philosophers and logicians have debated this list. This is the traditional 10 list of categories some philosophers have thought we can simplify this list. Others have thought you can also add new categories to this list. But in any case, let's work with it. And we're going to do a few of these problems from the textbook. So Peter Kreef writes that we are to identify the category of each categorimatic term in the following sentences. Now recall that a categorimatic term is a term that can stand on its own as a unit of meaning. That's unlike a syncategorimatic term, which cannot. A syncategorimatic term is like a logical connective, like and or 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 the word the. That has no meaning as a unit by itself. It's always, so to speak, connected to something else in a sentence. Um, but let's just go through these. And I think it's helpful just to write this out. It's easier to do. Um, so let's try to do that. And I'm going to try to... See, I need to buy some equipment that I don't have to hold this camera this way. So... In any case, um, let's do this. Let's look at the first sentence from Peter Kreef's textbook. So it says, In the square sat seven skinny soldiers stuck in the socks at six o'clock. It's a very literary style to Peter Kreef, which you might enjoy. So we can't just think about logic in terms of mathematics, but also we can think about it in terms of the liberal arts and even sometimes poetry, believe it or not. Yeah, we can relate logic to poetry, at least in certain cases. Okay, so let's think about the terms. So in the square, in the square. So in, well, in the square. So in is a relation. So in here is a relation, right? The square, the square. So the square is clearly a place. So we're thinking about the different categories. We're trying to identify these terms in terms of the 10 categories. So this allows us to think more clearly about, about sentences. So we can classify things better. We can think about the nuances better. So this is a very helpful exercise, actually. So in the square sat seven skinny soldiers. So sat, well, that is clearly an action, right? Sitting is an action. Seven, clearly a quantity. So this is not so bad. I think it looks harder than it actually is. Skinny soldiers, so being skinny, 
that's a quality of the soldier. So soldiers, well, those are substances. So we can point to those soldiers. So they, so they're stuck in the sock. So stuck is a posture or position. Position or posture in the socks. So in, once again, we have a relation in the socks. So is it socks or stocks? Did I write that correctly? I wonder. Let me see this. Um, in the stocks. Yeah, I knew that was... Yeah, I knew that didn't make sense. Yeah, they're supposed to be stocks. I'm sorry. So this is stocks. And that is a substance or substances at six o'clock. So six, of course, is a quantity. And o'clock, we have time. So we can think about words, terms, in terms of the categories. This allows us to analyze the meaning of words, of sentences, of propositions in a more profound way without question. And this definitely helps in thinking about just the liberal arts in general. Okay? Not just thinking about propositions, but thinking about complex sentences we may encounter when we're reading uh, novels, even poetry. So I think that traditional logic can help us in a very expansive sense. And I think these exercises actually show that. Um, all right, let's work on number two. So here we have, Near the blasted heath at midnight, the three weird sisters stood gleefully stirring the round black witch's pot filled with three tiny broken frogs. So these are very peculiar sentences to be sure. All right. So near the blasted heath, near, near. So what does near mean? You're by it, so there's a relation. So near, we have a relation. The blasted heath, blasted. So what is blasted? Something's being... Um, something's undergoing something, right? The heath is undergoing something. So this we have a passion. Heath, we have a substance. At midnight, so of course midnight is just a time, right? The three weird sisters stood. Okay, so three. Of course we have a quantity. Weird, well that would be describing the sisters, so we have a quality there. And sisters, those are individual persons, so these are substances. And we're thinking about substances, by the way, in relation to each other, because they're sisters. Okay, so stood is a position, or what Peter Kreef would call a posture. Gleefully stirring the round black witch's pot filled with three tiny broken frogs. Okay. So gleefully, gleefully stirring. So that's a quality of stirring. So this is a quality. Stirring. Well, that's an activity. So that's an action. The round black witch's pot. So round black. So these are qualities. So this is a quality. This is a quality. Which is pot. So notice the apostrophe. So the possession. It's a possessive word, right? So we're really thinking about a possession, as Peter Creep calls it, or a habit. I know the word is somewhat strange to say habit, but this will be a habit, or maybe it's better thought of in Peter Kreef's terminology of possession. It's a witch's pot. So a pot is an individual thing. It's a substance. Filled with three broken frogs. So filled. So filled, we're talking about under, an undergoing. So this is a passion. With three. So three obviously is a quantity. Tiny, so that's a quality. Broken, 
Brock, so broken, being broken. So in that sense, I think it's best to be thought of as a passion because it underwent something. So they are broken. They, they became broken, so to speak. And then frogs, of course, is a substance. This is pretty cool. It's a pretty interesting sentence, a weird sentence to be sure, um, but it allows us to, to really dissect that sentence. And you can see how that can be helpful when reading complicated passages, reading poetry, analyzing poetry, let's say, analyzing prose um, in an old book or whatever. We'll do two more problems. And let me make sure I don't make a mistake here, besides just pointing the camera in ways that I don't like. But, um, but hopefully this can be, hopefully you can still, um, you know, see this and it's not too distracting my movements and so forth or shadows. Okay, so number three is politically proper Professor Pete painted partly pink, preferred puzzling paradoxes of pop psychology, ponderously pontificating. Another very literate style here with this, uh, this sentence. All right, so politically proper Professor Pete. Politically proper. So politically proper. We're describing that Professor Pete, right? He's politically proper. So it's a quality of him. So politically quality, proper quality. Okay. Professor Pete, so that's a particular person. So we have a substance. Painted partly pink. So painted, he was painted. He was painted, so that is a passion. He went, he, 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 um, he underwent something, right? Being painted. So partly pink, so we have a quality. And, um, no, I'm sorry. Why, am I, why would I say that's a quality? Partly, so that's a quantity. And then the quality is the pink, right? Okay. So politically proper Professor Pete painted partly pink, proffered puzzling paradoxes of pop psychology, ponderously pontificating. So proffered, that's an action. Puzzling paradoxes. So puzzling, the paradoxes are puzzling. So we're talking about a quality here. And we're using the term substance in a loose sense to say a paradox is a, uh, pardon me, that a paradox is a, um, a substance. But we're thinking of it as um, like a mental entity. So we're going to say in quotation substance. I don't, I think it's kind of misleading to think of that as a substance. Um, but in this context, we're thinking of this as a substance, in the sense that, um, I don't know, it's it's an individual thing, it's an entity, even though it's just like a, a mental a mental being, it's a, something we're, we have in our head. Um, so we're, we're treating it as a substance, even though it's not a true substance, metaphysically. Um, a true substance, metaphysically, is just something that exists out there in the world, but we cannot just point to a paradox, so it's not, it's not a substance in a true metaphysical sense, but... Um, but it's a mental entity in a sense right now. We're thinking of a mental entity as, as a kind of substance. Okay, so politically proper, Professor Pete painted partly pink, preferred puzzling paradoxes of pop psychology, ponderously pontificating. So we have pop psychology, so pop is a quality, and psychology in this sense also we will call a substance. And I put that in quotations. So it's a substance in a very loose sense. Ponderously, pontificating. So ponderously is a quality. And pontificating going on and on, of course, is in the action. And I'm sorry if I'm pontificating, by the way. Okay. I'll try to get better at doing these videos. I'm just an amateur trying my best. Okay. Maybe you're trying your best too. Because some of these exercises can be tricky. Number four. Yeah, this is definitely, this book is written by Peter Kreef, trust me. I mean, if you've read any other Peter Kreef book and some of his humor, you will understand how, why these sentences 
are the way they are, honestly. Okay. So who said Catholics cannot be fun and and create crazy ideas and say crazy things? Okay. Okay. Number four, pooping on pieces of pork in the park is proper performance for perky pelicans. Okay. Yeah. This is written by Peter Creeped, I think. Okay. Joking about pooping. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, this is a Peter Creeped book. Okay. So pooping, what is that? What kind of category is that? Well, it's clearly an action, right? So this is an action. Pooping on pieces of pork, on. So on is a relation. Pieces of pork, so pieces of. We should really think about a quantity. Pork would be a substance, right? In the park. So in the park. Well, that's just a place, location, is proper performance. So performance is an action. Proper, proper performance. So proper is a quality of performance. So proper is a quality. And performance is an action. For perky pelicans. So pelicans obviously are substances. This is a substance or substances. Perky. Well, it's a quality of them, so this is a quality. Okay, so now we have pooping on pieces of pork in the park is proper performance for perky pelicans. So you might not think this has anything to do with logic, that sentence, but we can nevertheless use logic to dissect that sentence, even a sentence as crazy as that one. All right, so this video has been a little bit longer than I would like, I suppose, and um, I'm sorry if the quality is not, you know, up there with other YouTubers, you know, I'm just an amateur just beginning at this. It'll take me a while. I'm slow, okay? Uh, it takes me a while to um, to improve on these types of types of things, especially with speak my, with my speaking abilities and so forth. I still have to work on that. But anyways, I hope this video has been helpful, especially if you're working through this book um, by Peter Kreeft, which I think is really the best traditional logic book out there. It's an opinionated book to be sure, but I mean, it's well written and there's humor in it, and um, this will really ground you in the liberal arts to apply logic to the liberal arts and to everyday argumentation and the argumentation you will encounter in hardcore philosophy books or even in novels or even in some ways poetry, believe it or not, because we can analyze words, we can analyze terms um, with traditional logic in a very strong, powerful sense. But I appreciate you watching this. If you did watch this entire thing, thank you. Um, yeah, I hope this video has been helpful. And um, forgive me for my, you know, for the, the, the more amateurish qualities of this video. But thank you so much. And um, I hope you are, hope you are well. Have a good day. Thanks for watching.